Timothy 1 with me this morning, please. 1 Timothy chapter 1. When you get the time, I encourage you to read 1 and 2 Timothy as soon as you can, because they're two wonderful, powerful books the Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Father, bless this holy book now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you just read that with me, would you come to the conclusion that this is a proud man? No, it's a humble man. And this is a man who understands completely what he's made out of. And in Romans 7, he said that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. No, there's not a man who had a problem with pride. I heard some preachers say that, but I don't believe it for a minute. Here's a humble man. His past humbled him. His salvation humbled him. The greatness of his God humbled him. The ministry of the Word of God humbled him. The calling that God laid upon his life humbled him. His understanding into spiritual things, his discernment humbled him. For he could see clearly what many others couldn't even imagine. But he said of himself, of all the sinners on the face of this earth, I am chief. Now I want you to hear that, and I want you to listen to this. I am telling you, if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I am heading straight in. I have earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. Now, having heard that, would you consider that a humble man? That's a proud man. That's an arrogant man. That's an ignorant man. That's a very wealthy man. As a matter of fact, he's one of the, he's one of the, he's one of the richest people in the whole world. He has billions, that's with a B, of dollars. Billions. Well known. When I get through preaching this message this morning, I'll leave his photograph and his identity lying on the pulpit. If you're interested in knowing who he is, all you've got to come up here and do is just simply look at it and read it. And, it'll, and you'll know exactly who I'm talking about. Most everybody in this house this morning should know who this man is when you see his picture and read his name. Now I'm going to take what this man said this morning and I'm going to break it down. Because I think he has a message to preach to us. He just said something to you. Now you hear preachers like me all the time while I'm in the pulpit. We're up here, we're up here week after week. We're preaching about law and grace. We're preaching about ignorance. We're preaching about self-righteousness and all these things. And you say, well, now, a lot of people get in their head, well, that's doctrine. That's just so much Bible doctrine. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to preach Bible doctrine to us. But then every once in a while, one pulls back the curtain and shows you his true heart and shows you that what we're preaching in this pulpit has a relevance. I mean, it's real. There's something going on out there that it applies to. And it certainly applies to this man, just like it applies to me and it applies to you. There's a real world you live in. It's not make-believe, it's real. And sinners are real, and salvation is real, and the battle for your soul is real, and heaven's real and hell's real, sin's real, and the blood of Christ is real. And so let's look at what this man said and compare it with the Bible. He said, I'm telling you, here's a man that is accustomed to giving orders. Here's a man that is accustomed to barking out orders and people jump. For people have a way 
of, uh, of uh, coming to somebody who has a lot of money like this. We call them gold diggers. Nothing has changed in 2014 from 1946 when I was born. People still uh, get around people like this and for monetary reasons, they want to be known. Befriend the guy with all the money. I'm telling you, he said. I wonder if he'd talk that way to God. Do you suppose that if he, and he won't, of course, he'll never see heaven unless he's born again. But you don't suppose for a minute that he'd have that attitude when he comes to the great white throne judgment. He won't be telling anybody anything. The Bible says in the book of Micah, he hath showed the old man what is good and what the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. The Lord said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew eleven fifteen. But in Ecclesiastes 5, 3, Solomon says, for a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. <laughs> the old timers used to say, keep your mouth shut and they won't know how stupid you are. <laughs> and then I heard this many times when I was a kid. And then open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> and you know, preachers have to be awful careful with that because I'm up here multiplying words. Week in and week out, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit of God and God Almighty on my soul, that I'll say something worthwhile instead of I think, I feel, I think, I feel, I think, I feel. I think and I feel won't help you, but the Word of God will. He said, if there is a God, he's an agnostic. At least I give him credit for not being an atheist. He said, if there is a God, is there a God? Do you know a God? Have you ever met that God? Do you know a real God? Not a philosophical God, not a theoretical God, but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one seated at the right hand of the Father that ever liveth, the one that gives me life every day of my life, the one that I pray to talk to every day that I live, the one that talks to me, the one that gave me something to live for, is there a real God? When I look at creation, I say to myself, there's got to be a God. When I look at the animal creation, I think to myself, there's got to be a creator. When I realize all around me, the beauty that's out there that I'll never see, yet it was made for me, it was made for him. All things were made by him and for him, it says in Colossians. Yes, sir, there is a God. Psalm 53 verse one said, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. Did you know that from the Bible, Genesis through Revelation, not one time does the Bible ever try to prove the existence of God? It doesn't do it. The Bible's not written to prove his existence. So why not, preacher? The Bible assumes that you're not a fool. The Bible gives you a compliment. <laughs> Aren't you glad? The Bible said, here you are now. I know you've got some sense. Now read this. It's the fool that says there is no God. They try to use Einstein, as I've told you before, to say there's no God. Einstein was not an atheist. No, sir, he doesn't fit anybody's camp. He said, if I am telling you, then he said, if there is a God, then he said, when I get to heaven. So he has, if there's a God, I'm going to heaven. That's an amazing thing that a man that made money by money, a man that made a lot of money by money, a shrewd man, a businessman, a kind of a man, very smart man, no question about that. You don't make billions of dollars. You don't make billions of dollars with an IQ of 50. Here's a man that is very smart. He's brilliant. Yet he said, when I get to heaven, if there is a God, here lies eternity in front of him. Here lies a darkness that he can't see into. Here lies an inevitability in front of him. Every one of us in this house today are going to answer the call. It is appointed to man once to die. Except we hear a shout and the Lord Jesus comes back.
and catches us up to meet him in the clouds. That's called the blessed hope. No more trips to the graveyard. No more operations. No more suffering. No more tears. No more sorrow. To think that at any moment all of that could come to an end. And the Lord Jesus could come back. That's a blessed hope. But it is going to happen if he does not come back, folks. You are going to have to go through the way, and so will I, that every human being has gone on this earth. It is inevitable. Have you prepared for that? He hasn't. He said, if there is a God, I'll go to heaven when I get to heaven. I'd like to ask him, sir, what makes you think you're going to heaven? I'd like to ask you. Let me ask you a question. I want to be just as simple and honest as I can. You going to heaven? How are you going to get to heaven? Well, I'm a Baptist. That's not going to get you to heaven. I'm good to my wife and I go to work every day and I pay my bills. That's not going to get you to heaven. Well, I know the Ten Commandments. I've been confirmed. I've been baptized. That won't get you to heaven. What will get you to heaven? There's no other way. But he said, when I get to heaven, he's not going to heaven. He said, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. My, 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 my. Galatians 6, 3 says, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. If you could... Take your billions to heaven with you. Let's just say you could. If you could. You've heard about the guy that was buried in his Cadillac. It happens all the time. You find the graves around Tutankhamun, a, a, a young Egyptian pharaoh, 15, 16, 17 years old. I mean, they had gold and shrouds and gold like you wouldn't believe buried with him for his afterlife. But I'm afraid Mr. Tutankhamun could not use any of it. King Tut I'm talking about. But if you could take it with you, wouldn't it do you any good? Because everything in heaven's free. No banks in heaven. No soup lines in heaven. No mortgages in heaven. You don't have to buy anything. It's all been paid for. You'll have a brand new body in heaven. A glorious body like unto his glorious body. Where you'll never grow old. You can stand by the river and you can look at each other and think, we'll never have to part. I'll love you forever. No separation, no sorrow, no graveyards, no death, no dying. Heaven's a wonderful place. Why somebody wouldn't go to heaven's beyond me. If you wouldn't want to go to heaven, why don't you want to go to heaven? Well, I've got heaven on earth. Live on. You're a fool. Well, I've got a big, I've got money in my bank. I feel healthy. I got a good marriage. I got a good job. I'm enjoying life. Yeah, I know you are. I know you are. How many of you in here were in the same boat? Somebody raise your hand. There was a time you enjoyed life. How many grew old? How many lost your job? How many had your kids rebel against you and go out into the world? How many had your body start aching and pain show up? <laughs> this is not heaven, folks. God didn't intend it to be. He said, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. Nobody's going to interview him. Nobody cares a thing about what he has to say. He has nothing to say. Nobody in heaven cares about anything he has to say. They don't care about his money. They don't care about his name. They don't care about his rank. But his arrogance has him so pumped up. I have something to say because it's me. I am me. I am a billionaire. People run when I tell them to. They jump when I tell them to jump. Oh, I know. And you are so blind. You are such a fool. Now, let me ask you a question. Will you stop to be interviewed when you get to heaven? I don't care that anybody ever saw my face or knows who I am. I'll just be there. I started in a dung hill and I'll sit at the Father's table. 
He'll put a robe around me and he'll put a, finger, a ring on my finger. He'll kill the fatted calf and spread the table before me. Oh, you think you're good enough to go to heaven? Oh, no, no, I ought to be in hell. I ought to be in hell with my back broke, as they used to say. I ought to be screaming in hell right now. I deserved hell, worked hard to get there, deserve everything God could dish out to me in judgment, but I'm not going to hell. Have you ever met the God that I preached to you this morning? One that will forgive you and cleanse you and give you a home in heaven. He only does that for certain people. Oh, no, 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 no. By the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. Now, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. Well, does he think the news media is in heaven? Does he think the paparazzi's up there taking photographs? What's he think heaven is? He thinks heaven is just a glorified earth. In his pagan, warped mind, he thinks heaven is just a little higher than the earth. Is that what you want? Would you like to live forever just a little higher than what you've got here? Most of you are bored to death every day anyway. Why would you want to live forever like that? Wouldn't you like for that almighty being to begin to open up for something in front of you? I'm talking about open up for you when you're ready for it, when you're prepared, where you can handle it, when you no longer have the confines of this flesh but have a glorified body. That he begins to unfold within you his plan, who he is. You begin to understand and see him for who he is. You can't enjoy heaven now where you are, but you will one day. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. But he said, I'm not stopping for any, any views. He said, I'm heading straight in. James 4, 15 says, for they... For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But he said, I'm heading straight in. In plain words, he said, get out of my way. I'm here. Now, where's he at? I want to see him. Oh. You say, preacher, I can't believe somebody would say that. He said it. He said it. New York Times printed it. That's a big newspaper. That's the record. All the news fit to print, they say. He said, I'm heading straight in. No short, no, uh, no diversions. I'm going right straight in. Some of you may believe that in here this morning about yourself. You may believe you're heading straight in. You, believe, you may believe you're going to heaven. What you've done, let me tell you what you've done. I'll be honest with you. Just as honest as I know how. You've compared yourself with everything on this earth and probably have a list drawn up of all the things that you haven't done and all the people that you're better than. And you're comparing yourself with that and you're saying, if there's any chance for them to go to heaven, I know I'm going to heaven. That's called self-righteousness. Your righteousness. The Bible said comparing themselves with themselves, they're not wise. But men will do it anyway. Folks, you don't go to heaven because you're good. You don't go to heaven because you treat people right. You don't go to heaven because you give people jobs and you've got all kinds of money and you start businesses and, and you build this and you build that. That doesn't, put you, that doesn't qualify you for heaven. The only thing that can qualify you for heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the door. By me ye shall enter in. If the Son make you free, you're free indeed. But he said, I'm heading straight in. Then he said, I have earned my place in heaven. The Apostle Paul said in Titus 3, 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he hath saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. But he says, I have earned my place in heaven. There are people that belong to lodges and secret organizations and groups and this and that and this and that. To this very day right now, this morning, if you brought them in this house, they'd look at you eyeball to eyeball and tell you they've been good enough to go to heaven. I've earned my place in heaven, he said. Earned it. Human ability, human righteousness. 
He earned his place in heaven. The old time preachers used to preach like this. They'd get up in the pulpit and they'd say, by the grace of God I am what I am and I've been saved, glory to God, but I ought to be in hell and you ought to be in hell and every one of us ought to be in hell, but God's been good to us and merciful and gracious to us and we're going to heaven because of Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, you're going to go to hell. But we don't hear anything about hell today. Hell's not a reality today. We don't hear it in the church, but we hear it in the world. It's everywhere. It's one of the most worn out words that you'll hear from anybody is the word hell. But the Bible's got a lot to say about hell. The Lord Jesus Christ preached more on hell than anybody else that ever lived on this earth. He preached on hell over and over and over again. This man says, I've earned my place in heaven. And then finally he said this, it's not even close. And I have to say, I agree with you finally. You're not close. Instead of saying, it's not even close, he should say, I'm not even close. Amen. How do you reach somebody like that? How do you reach, how do you reach religious people that go to church every Sunday? They're one thing on Sunday and something else all week long. They're pure hypocrites. How do you reach people like that? There's only one that can soften this man's heart and convict him and save him. Just one. It's a sad, sad thing that a man believes what this man believes. But it's a good thing for you and for me that he's honest enough to admit it. What you have heard this morning is a perfect example of a self-righteous man who thinks because he is rich, wealthy, and he's done a lot of money, a lot of good things with his money, that he has earned his way into heaven. Now what do you think God is going to do with him? What do you think he'll do? He'll look at him and he'll say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray now that you'd use what I've said this morning. I pray for this man. Lord, there's no way in the world I get up here and say what I said without praying for him. I pray for him. Heavenly Father, he's exhausted his money. He's exhausted his, he's exhausted it. Everything that he could possibly do or possibly say. Lord, this man, Heavenly Father, has come to the point in his life and what he says and what I've read, that there's nowhere else for him to go. He's, he's accomplished it. He's there. He's arrived. And Lord, you're the only one that can break through that shell and speak to that man's soul and so show him that he's lost and that he needs to be saved. I pray for him. I pray that that'd happen. And then, Father, I pray for those who heard me this morning, who heard me in this church house, who may hear this later. If they're trusting in the least way anything else than our Lord Jesus Christ to save their soul, they're trusting and standing on sinking sand, shifting sand, and there'll be no hope for them, there'll be no help for them. I ask this now in Jesus' name, and for Jesus' sake I pray, amen.